Shalom Alechem. Peace be with you. This is a documentary, and this is a summary of a documentary which I have already prepared in some detail, but this is just a summary dealing with the, uh, with the issues and not so much with personalities at this point. My detailed documentary, however, um, does deal with um, details and uh, naming uh, all parties involved. I am a priest in the Anglican Communion. Uh, I was ordained in the Diocese of Barbados some 50 years ago. December of 1962 as a deacon, and then in December of 1963 as a priest. And I serve uh, in the Diocese of Barbados uh, until 1966 when I left and went to study in Toronto, the University of Toronto in Canada, and served in the parish there in 1966-1967. I returned to the Diocese of Barbados in 1967 and uh, was vicar of St. Augustine's and subsequently rector until 1975, January, when I came to this country to study at Columbia University and, and I then became uh, a curate of a parish here in, in the Episcopal Church in this diocese. I am making this documentary and giving this information for four main reasons. One, to respond to actions that were taken by my former bishop, the bishop of this diocese, and two, to explain my side of the whole situation. Uh, it's a very long story, uh, but nevertheless, I will try my best to uh, present the facts as best as I know how and best as I remember them. Three, to show how bullying works in the church, especially in the Episcopal Church. We think of bullying in terms of schools, youngsters in schools and so on, but it's even worse when it is found in the church. And fourthly, this is intended to help clergy and vestry members to avoid some of the pitfalls that I experienced uh, in the last four years or so. I was appointed and elected uh, rector of a parish in this diocese in March of 1987. And at that time, uh, I was teaching. I was teaching in the City University system at Medgarvis College, and I was also uh, a teacher of mathematics uh, in the in New York Public High School. When I was uh, elected uh, in my parish, uh, the parish had very few members. And the salary which was offered to me was very low. It was much less than what I was earning as an educator. But however, I agreed with the vestry and the bishop at the time that I would accept what they had to offer on condition that as I help the parish to grow uh, in numbers and financially that my salary would increase accordingly. But I served in that parish from uh, March of March 1st, 1987 right through until July 31st, uh, 2008. And I had to retire because uh, of compulsory retirement at the age of 72. Before I retired, 
I loan some money to the church. And also the church owed me some money for in lieu of sabbatical. And, and let me explain this for the benefit of those of you who don't know how the system works. The, in the Episcopal Church, for a parish to maintain its parish status, uh, that is a status where it could elect its own vestry and the vestry elects the rector and so on. In order to do that, the parish had to be financially viable and able to not only support uh, the clergy but also to, uh, that includes paying the clergy pensions and so on. But we had challenges throughout the years in keeping up with uh, the clergy pension. And as I was getting ready to retire, uh, it became a great concern and the former bishop, the bishop at the time, expressed his concern about uh, the fact that uh, the, the pension, my pension, had not been paid up and I was getting ready to retire. So I sat with the vestry and we discussed the various options of how we would take care of that because um, the, the vestry in particular and the congregation in general uh, they were adamant that they wanted to retain their parish status and I tried to help them by uh, making them to understand that in order to do that, they had to pay the pension. And the bishop at the time, he also emphasized that point. So the options that we looked at were, one, that we would ask the congregation for uh, help in order to pay the pension arrears, and because it was very urgent. Two, that members of the vestry would lend money uh, to the church pay the pension and then of course uh, the money would be and they'd be reimbursed. Well we chose the, 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 the second, the latter uh, option. Uh, and we, we did receive some help from the congregation but then we also uh, decided that since we did not receive enough that we would, those of us who were able, we would contribute towards the pension fund uh, by, by small gifts and also by loans. And I always believe that as a member of the team, uh, leader of the vestry, I try to set an example. And I also uh, loaned uh, some money to the church. And it was agreed unanimously by the vestry to repay me after I had retired. And in addition to that, the, the church owed me six months sabbatical and we looked at various options of how we would uh, be able to satisfy that that obligation on the part of the church and the one that we settled on was that in no of sabbatical that I would be paid and this was agreed upon unanimously by the vestry and also by the general congregation at the annual parish meeting and as a result of the fact that it was unanimous, both of those agreements were unanimous, there were promissory notes that were signed, signed by the wardens on behalf of the vestry. I mean, there was no question about the fact that they owed me this money. As I said, it was agreed upon unanimously by the congregation and then uh, by the vestry. And here I have in my hand uh, two promissory notes. One signed by uh, both, warden, both wardens and the other one signed by one of the wardens. But both legal documents. And these documents I just stated, and I will read them for you because it's very important. The first one um, reads, with this promissory note, it is the intention of this vestry to repair the Reverend Canon Dr. G. Llewellyn Armstrong 
the amount of $24,000, an amount owed to him for two different and separate loans made to the parish and they named the parish. The amount of $12,000 is the balance owed on the first loan of $40,000 made during the month of February 2008. The second amount of $12,000 is the total amount of the second loan made during the month of July 2008. We will begin to make payments towards the total amount of $24,000 beginning with the initial payment of $2,000 made on Thursday, October 16, 2008, leaving a balance of $22,000. The balance will be paid in installments of $2,000 on the 30th of every month until the balance is paid in full. As previously directed by him, the monthly payments will be deposited to his account. This promissory note be binding on the wardens and vestry and all succeeding wardens and vestry of the parish. This was agreed upon in Brooklyn, New York, 16th of October 2008, by the wardens and vestry of the parish, and it was signed by the wardens. The second promissory note, and that's the first one, second promissory note reads as follows. At the annual parish meeting of the church held on January 14, 2007, it was agreed by the entire membership in attendance that the parish would pay the Reverend Canon Dr. G. Llewellyn Armstrong the basic salary and security at the 2008 budgeted amount for six months in lieu of six months sabbatical leave earned by him during his tenure as rector. The amount agreed on by the rector and the parish was $46,041.88. It is the intention of this vestry to honor this agreement. At this date of October 4th, 2008, we will begin to make payments towards the amount of $46,041.88, beginning with the initial payment of $5,000 and $41.88, made on Sunday, October 5th, 2008, leaving a balance of $41,000. The balance of $41,000 will be paid in installments of $3,000 on the 15th of every month until the total amount is paid in full. The next payment will be due on November 15, 2008. As previously directed by him, the monthly payments will be deposited to his account. This promissory note will be binding on the wardens and vestry and all succeeding wardens and vestry of the church. Agreed upon in Brooklyn, New York, 5th day of October 2008, by the wardens on the behalf of the vestry of the church. Signed by both wardens. These are the two promissory notes and I treated them as legal documents and therefore they're binding. I did receive two payments. When the bishop at the time, uh, the former bishop, stopped the payments and uh, stated that in a letter uh, to the vestry and to me, stated that these payments should discontinue until such time as I was able to uh, have give a proper accounting of the whole financial situation and until I was able to return uh, completed records uh, belonging to the church which were in my possession. Uh, the bishop uh, summoned me uh, to his office to meet with the Chancellor and, and himself, and um, I was accompanied by my attorney, and we sat and discussed the whole issue. I explained to him that these promissory notes were signed by the wardens and so on after thorough uh, investigation, thorough planning, um, and it was unanimously agreed by the congregation as well. 
Well, I, in the meantime, uh, since the bishop had stopped the payments, my a whole budget uh, was affected because I was depending on this money to pay my bills, including pay, pay my taxes. And after uh, we did not hear from the bishop, after some time, uh, my attorney wrote to him and just notified him that we needed to have some resolution. Uh, we need to have these payments continued. If not, the matter will have to go before the courts because this was a contract. I know the canons of the Episcopal Church state that you know no uh, priest uh, has a right to to take any matters in the church matters about doctrine before the civil courts. This is not about doctrine. This was about a contract, and it's my view, and it's, it was then and still is that. Uh, the bishop had no right to stop these payments because this was a contract. Uh, this matter is still before the civil court, sadly, uh, and unfortunately, uh, so much money has been wasted on the part of the diocese in order to avoid paying me uh, the balance of my money, which is due and owing to me. The whole thing really could have been handled much differently. But sadly, and I really um, must be frank with you here, sadly in this diocese, the main problem at the bottom, lying at the bottom of my whole uh, case here is the problem of human sexuality. The bishop in question, uh, from the time I uh, became rector of this parish, this bishop came to this diocese just a year after I came, and he came with an agenda, and quite frankly, it is what I call the gay agenda. He made it quite clear from the beginning and he shocked many people that he was very much in favor of the gay lifestyle uh, and well that, that was his uh, view I disagreed very very strongly because uh, I really believed then and still believe and always will believe that this is against uh, the Bible it's against nature uh, I am not here to pass judgment on anybody. I'm not here to be opposed to, uh, to gay people uh, or to people involved in same-sex unions. It is not about opposition. My role is to be a proponent of the good news of the gospel, of the Bible, to teach what the Bible teaches. I make no attempt to remake anyone in my image. God made us all in his image. And people are what they are, and I don't question who they are and what they are. I question their behavior. However, uh, in, I noticed in the 21 years that I served uh, in that parish and under the former bishop, that those of us who did not go along with that agenda were very often ostracized. I can give evidence of that uh, in greater detail on another occasion if necessary. So the treatment that was meted out to me, beginning with the former bishop, was meted out to me because of my views. Because I saw others who were either openly gay or, or were, were very sympathetic to that lifestyle being treated differently, vastly differently. In fact, I don't want to reopen old wounds, but I have a copy here of a report uh, that was given as a result of an article in Penthouse back in the 90s in which uh, some of the clergy in the diocese were involved. And how were the clergy rewarded? One of them 
was made archdeacon, and he's now uh, married to a man. Uh, that's his business, but I would have nothing of, of this kind of lifestyle in the Episcopal Church uh, um, where I uh, would want to be serving under any bishop who expects me to go along with that kind of teaching. So uh, this is the basis of, of my problem because there were people who uh, did things, did other things, and I'm going to come to some of those things uh, shortly, and they were never punished. Uh, they were rewarded um, uh, because, you know, the, the, the thinking at that time was if you're gay, it's okay. If you're straight, you have to wait until you're gay, and then you'll be okay. Well, I will never, it will never be okay for me because I am straight, and I will always be straight, and not only my straight, but I, I teach what the Bible has to teach about human sexuality and human relationships. Now, the case, as I said, involving money due and owing to me, that case is still before the civil court, and therefore I will not be going into any details about that. Just to say that, that so much money is being wasted. Uh, there have been quite a few appearances, and every appearance, I'm sure, costs a lot of money. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that close to half a million dollars have been spent so far uh, just trying to avoid paying me my money and trying to punish me uh, because of my views. That bishop also had a serious alcoholic problem. And everybody knew that. And I mentioned that not in any way to condemn him. In fact, I prayed for him. I was very sympathetic. I still do pray for him every day. But I mentioned that because I believe that that played a very important role, a devastating role, in his relationship with me. Because on that occasion when I met with him and the Chancellor, uh, he was inebriated in my view, and therefore could not function as the pastor that I expected him to function. Um, it's interesting that in 2009, uh, he was uh, on sick leave uh, and told that he was uh, in, in some sort of rehab institution, um, getting help. and. and we all were praying for him that he would uh, get some, some help. But he called for a, a coadjutor bishop. Um, and a coadjutor bishop, for those of you who don't know how the system works, is a bishop who is elected, and, and, and if it is a priest, consecrated, um, and who has the automatic right of succeeding the diocesan bishop the chief bishop. In 2008, a uh, coadjutor bishop was elected and consecrated. And usually, when uh, a coadjutor bishop is, uh, is in place, the diocesan has the right to remain in the diocese for an additional three years, uh, supposedly to help to mentor uh, the new bishop. In this case, the former bishop, as soon as the coadjutor was consecrated, the former bishop was forced to leave the diocese. Was forced to leave the diocese abruptly. So that the coadjutor bishop then became the diocesan bishop in a very short time, in fact, about two months after he was consecrated. Well, he is a present bishop of the diocese. And in, he became the diocesan bishop in November of 2009. By January, two months later, he was literally on my case. He wrote to 
my former parish, a letter that was very damaging to me, and mentioned things that were not true. And I have copies of that, in that letter. He also uh, did something that was very illegal, I would say. In fact, I, I just want to make this point that this present bishop, in my view, is a bully. And I want to tell the whole world that he is a bully. And I have told him that if he is going to deal with me, have a relationship with me that is pastoral, I'd be willing to work with him. I told him, but I do stand up to bullies. And I, will, I know it's a very harsh thing to say, but it is true. And bullying in the church is a terrible thing. And I will tell you, for the last four years or so, I have just been bullied. So this is now my time to stand up to the present bishop, who is a bully. He sent an, another bishop to my former parish to hold on as priest in charge, bishop in residence, whatever, and he wrote to the congregation telling them that he was sending uh, this bishop, you know, to be in charge. Now, he did not consult the vestry. He did not consult the vestry. And the canons require that the bishop, after consultation with the vestry, can do this. He was wrong. Second thing that he did was wrong, that was wrong, was that he sent this bishop to preside at an annual parish meeting. Again, this was wrong. The religious corporations law of the state of New York, anybody can, can read those, you can go online and read them, uh, states that at an annual parish meeting, if there is no rector, the person who presides at the meeting is one of the wardens, the one who's called to the chair by members present and voting. One of the wardens. If only, warden, only one warden is there, then that warden presides. There is no provision in the law for not even the bishop to preside at an annual parish meeting because he's not a member of the corporation. Now, if I'm wrong, just check the law. I'm not a lawyer, but I can read. So this bishop was wrong in sending uh, another bishop or anybody to preside at an annual parish meeting uh, when uh, the bishop did not have the right to do that. Unfortunately, I was advised to appear at that meeting because my attorney at the time uh, suggested that I should go because I had a report, a very important report, to present to the meeting uh, because I had been rector up to the end of July of 2008. And therefore, uh, I felt that I should be there and I went there just to present the report. When I went there, I was not allowed to speak. I was not allowed to speak. I was treated very shabbily by the bishop in question who was there really presiding illegally. That became an issue in the civil case. And so I would just leave that alone for the time being. And the present bishop, the diocesan bishop, uh, he continued his persecution of me by inhibiting me. An inhibition is a sort of suspension, temporary suspension of ministry. In March of 2010, uh, he wrote to me uh, a letter of temporary inhibition in which he stated that as a result of uh, I read here, 
as a result of an audit conducted by a CPA firm, which he mentions, of your discretionary account maintained by you as rector of the parish during the period June 14, 2002 to October 15, 2008. It has been determined that, and he went on to give some details about uh, the findings in this so-called audit. And as a result of that, he says, your actions with respect to the said discretionary account are in violation of the constitution and canons for the government, government of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States and of the manual of business methods in church affairs. And he went on to say, you are therefore temporarily inhibited from all public, pastoral, liturgical, and sacramental ministry in this church. This temporary inhibition is issued in accordance with Title IV, Canon 1, Section 2A and B. Uh, well, this was very devastating for me. Devastating. Firstly, because the bishop had never met me. He had never spoken to me. Uh, one. And two, this was not an audit. I know that uh, the uh, claims that the term audit uh, can be used generically to refer to any sort of accounting, financial accounting. But I'll come to this later, where the firm, the, the, the leader of the, the accountant firm, uh, defined an audit as a systematic, and that is the key word there, and I don't know how it could be systematic if nobody asked me any questions about this discretionary fund. And the discretionary fund was administered by me as rector of the parish. Uh, and let me again give information for the benefit of those who are not familiar with how the system works. Uh, the canons and the constitution of the Episcopal Church provide for uh, a fund, which is called the Almoners Fund, uh, is a fund is set up uh, and administered by the priest uh, to help people who are in need. And it tells you exactly how the fund should be set up. Now, when I became rector in March of 1987, the agreement, because we had to signed the agreement, and the agreement was reached among uh, three parties, uh, the, the, the vestry, the bishop, and me, among the three of us, so to speak. And the, the vestry never mentioned to me anything about a manual of business affairs. The Rector's discretionary fund was set up at that time according to the terms set out in the general canons of the Episcopal Church. We stated that the, uh, the offering at the communion service one Sunday per month, the loose offering, uh, undesignated offering, uh, should be given to the Rector's discretionary fund and other contributions uh, are put in this fund to be administered by the rector uh, to help the poor and so on and so forth. And I administered that fund according to the terms under which the fund was set up in 1987. I did not know of any manual of business affairs uh, going into details about not using an ATM uh, ATMs and so on. Uh, I didn't know about that. But ignorance of the law is no excuse. But here is a very important point, my brothers and sisters. And this is where the bishop is to be blamed. The canons state that before any priest could be inhibited that he must 
be informed of the availability of a consultant. A consultant should be provided to uh, the priest at the beginning of the whole process, before he is inhibited. Now, I was never given a consultant. And the function of that consultant is to advise uh, the priest who is charged and also uh, to give information to the priest's attorney if he has an attorney, explaining the whole process. I was never given a consultant until some two years later, after the bishop had done all the damage that he could do against me. Now that was in March of 2010 when I was inhibited and at that point I was serving in a parish, assisting in a parish and working as chaplain of the parish school and I learned really from the rector of the parish that I had been inhibited even before I received the letter from the bishop. So from that moment onwards, I could not serve. Now, you tell me, tell me, brothers and sisters, tell me people who call themselves Christians, tell me anybody who is reasonable, do you think this is right? Do you think it is right? I mean, here it is, the bishop, who should have provided a consultant to me from the very beginning, did not. And then he turned around and punished me for what he saw, what he accused me of, as mistakes. Now, who do you think should be punished? Well, I leave it to you uh, to decide. But you know, I, I turn to, now turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 12. And this is a conversation that David and Saul had when Saul was seeking David's life to destroy him and David had the chance to really kill Saul and he didn't and David said to Saul may the Lord judge between me and you may the Lord avenge me on you but my hand shall not be against you may the Lord judge between me and this bishop who is a bully The bishop, that was in uh, March of 2010, and it, it was terrible because that same night I was supposed to be taking, I uh, did be uh, assisting in a funeral for a former colleague, the son of a former colleague, and the family was devastated when uh, the rector of the parish told me that, well, of course, since he had received this letter from the bishop, I could no longer function. That was so unfair. That was in March. In June of the same year, the same rector through the same school offered me a temporary position as acting principal of the school because he thought, well, this is not, not a, a, a priestly function. So uh, there's no breach of the, uh, the, the uh, inhibition. We sat down and we, I told him I was willing to help because I'm an educator and I had the experience. We discussed salary, starting date and so on. The starting date was supposed to be the 1st of July, 2010. When the bishop heard, the bishop called the priest and told him not to give me the job because I would have been arrested for money laundering and tax evasion in about two weeks or so. And that was a lie. Now, I, I know bishops are human beings too. Would you expect a certain standard of people who call themselves pastors? 
that was a lie and he knew that it was a lie. Do you think that is right? And as a result, I lost the opportunity to earn a living. That was in June of 2010. In October of the same 2010, on October 10th, 2010, how can I forget? It was 10, 10, 10, 10. October 10th, 2010, at 10 o'clock in the morning, he went to my former parish with the chancellor and told the congregation, among other things, that I had stolen money from the church. There was a member of the congregation who was a stenographer and who recorded every single word and who produced that conversation and swore to an affidavit, which I have, I have the affidavit right here. And among other things, he, between him and the, the chancellor, they said that they had in their hands checks that were made out to me and cashed by me, and they don't know what I did with that money. Well, how very dishonest. Those checks could only be my salary. And what do you expect anybody to do with this salary? You cash your checks. You cash your checks. But they, 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 they did this at a distance, of course. They didn't show them to anybody there. And that was so dirty on, behalf, on the part of the bishop. I'm not very really concerned about the chancellor. See, I'm concerned about the bishop because anything that the chancellor says and the bishop does not correct if it is wrong, then the bishop is responsible, but morally responsible because he is the one who is the pastor. He is the one who made vows at his ordination and consecration. And this was very insulting to the people of the parish because what I remember of the people of the parish that I left is that they're intelligent people. And imagine the bishop going to the parish and, and giving them, leaving them with the impression that somehow I had stolen church money. Nothing of the kind was true. It's far from the truth. I am not a taker. I'm a giver. And later I will show the amount of money that I have given to that church. I believe in tithing. I taught tithing and I practiced tithing. I was the largest contributor to that church in all the years that I was there. But back to the point about what the bishop did on October the 10th, 2010 at 10 o'clock. This was devastating for members of the congregation because some of them were puzzled. They had never heard of my embezzling funds from the church. At the same time, these members of the congregation, most of them are from the Caribbean, and these are the people who believe in a bishop, believe that when a bishop spoke, that he was telling the truth. Well, for the first time, maybe many of them were hearing a bishop telling lies in church. That is what happened on October 10th. And I have a copy of the affidavit of the minutes that was taken by that member on that occasion. In November, on November 13th to be exact, there was the diocesan convention. I received an invitation to convention like every other priest. As usual, I received an invitation. I responded to the invitation by attending convention because there was nothing in the canons that told me that I could not attend convention. And since I did not have a consultant at the time when I should have had one, then I went to convention. I registered, I paid my fee for lunch, received my credentials and I went and sat on the floor of convention. 
At one point, I got up to ask a question about a figure of $135,000 being given to a church in this diocese. And the, this still has to be investigated because I, I suspect that there is something just not right about this. Uh, and I want that to be noted because that was the question I was about to ask. But when I approached the mic and announced my name, the bishop shouted, because he had never met me up to that point. He shouted my name and told me to leave convention right away because I had no right being a convention since I was inhibited. He did this in the presence of over a thousand people. You can imagine how I felt. He shouted at me. And I tried to explain to him that I had the invitation to convention, to show him the invitation. He didn't want to hear anything. He just jumped up. He says, convention is suspended. Turn off the mics. Turn off the mics. Convention is suspended. You can imagine that. A bishop, a pastor. At that point, I was very angry at all the treatment, the bullying that I had received from him, and I called him an evil man. Yes, I did. Because I see so much evil in that man. He had me escorted out of convention by two security guards. You imagine that, a priest of almost 50 years, serving in this diocese for many years, 30 some years being treated like that. And if he were a true pastor and not the crude person that he was and still is, he would have called me to the front, to his desk and said to me, well, Colonel Armstrong, you, you know, you're inhibited, you should not have been here. I would have left peacefully and discussed the matter, the issue with him on some subsequent occasion. But let me tell you that he had no right to do that. Not only was it crude, but it was uncanonical. Because the canons state that if any delegate of convention, if there's any question about the, the right of a, of a clergy person to be attending convention, that decision had to be made by convention itself. Convention did not have a chance to make a decision. The bishop himself had me escorted out of convention and you can imagine how I felt I felt insulted I felt humiliated and I was angry with a righteous anger and I went home and I sat down and wrote a letter of complaint to his superior and more about that later I made some complaints against him to his superior That was in November of 2010. In December of 2010, he charged me before the Ecclesiastical Court of the Diocese. He wrote to the Diocesan Review Committee, which is like a grand jury, and he made certain complaints against me. And I will read them. He said, on March 15, 2010, I issued a temporary inhibition to Canon Armstrong, which inhibited him from all public, pastoral, liturgical, and sacramental ministry in this church. This temporary inhibition was for a period of 90 days. And he goes on to say that a copy is enclosed. Here are the charges. On November 13th, 2010, while wearing a clerical collar, Canon Armstrong entered upon the floor of the Austin Convention, disrupted the proceedings, causing them to be suspended until such time as he was willing to remove himself from the floor of convention. Such conduct 
represents a direct violation of the temporary inhibition imposed upon Canon Armstrong and is therefore a violation of his ordination vows. <laughs> My ordination vows tell me that I should obey the godly admonition of my bishop. Is lying godly? Why should I obey him when he is a bully and a liar? Since such conduct, therefore, constitutes a violation of Title IV, Canon 1, Section 1H. That's A, the first charge. Now note how he put it. While wearing a clerical call, he would give one the impression that I went in off the streets and just went in the convention, the disruptive convention. My brothers and sisters, I was invited to convention. I received an invitation. I have a copy of that invitation right here. Second charge was, while inhibited, can an Armstrong function liturgically at a funeral mass at, and he names the church in another diocese. And he enclosed a letter uh, from the priest and from the priest bishop dated November 30th, 2010. Now, in that letter, the priest lied. The priest said that he did not know that I had been inhibited. And that is not true. Let me give you a little background. The mother of a dear friend of mine died, and the family wanted me to be involved. But they knew that I had been inhibited, and they were not sure whether the inhibition extended beyond the diocese. And so they were very careful. They spoke with the priest. I spoke with the priest myself, and I told him. And it was agreed that what I would do was just the opening sentences at the funeral mass. Because opening sentences, not necessarily a liturgical function, it's not a priestly function, there are lay people who uh, have done that. And I was satisfied to do that. I was satisfied just to be present at the funeral of my dear friend's mother. But during the service, during the mass, the priest, in the presence of everybody there, said to me, you know, I, I am, my, my throat is a bit sore, and I, uh, would you celebrate? And I even asked him, I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, you celebrate. So in the presence of the people who were there, he exchanged, he gave me the chasuble, and I put on the chasuble and celebrated. That priest wrote to his bishop, and that priest appeared in the hearing, the ecclesiastical court hearing, which I'll tell you about shortly, and lied and said he did not know that I was inhibited, and that was a lie. And that was not bad enough. He even stated that, you know, he, he did not move in my circles and never will. Well, thank God, because I don't you move the circles of liars. The priest lied to his bishop, and, and, and I'm sure that when I'm finished with this, that the bishop will get to know the lies because I have the letter, I have all the communication. When he stated that he did not have any contact with me before the actual mass on the Saturday morning, that was a lie because the night before, and I have the order of service here, the night before at the vigil at the funeral home, he and I officiated at the vigil and he knew my name was on the, on, on the program for the vigil my name was not on the program for the, for the mass this Saturday morning because uh, you know we, 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 as I said uh, I, I wasn't sure exactly what would happen I didn't want to cause any problems for the family but that priest lied and I'm going to expose his lie whatever consequences uh, result. Third charge that the bishop made against me. While inhibited, Canon Armstrong performed a wedding in a private home. This was true. I performed a wedding in a private home and I 
I did not see this as any violation of the inhibition. It was not in church, and I'm a marriage officer of the state of New York. I was not uh, defrocked. I was just inhibited. And inhibition, if you're going to um, think about due process, a person, at least in these United States, should be treated as innocent until he or she is proven to be guilty. I did conduct the wedding. The next charge that was made against me On about January 4th, 2009, Janet Armstrong inappropriately appeared at the annual meeting of such parish. Now, he was not even in the diocese at that time. Since I am informed that he disrupted the meeting and that he attempted to read a statement from his attorney, and that was not true, or any statement from my attorney. It was a report that the attorney had told me that I should go and deliver. I wasn't even given a chance to explain anything. When he was denied the opportunity to do so, and while the bishop was attempting to speak to him, he abruptly left the meeting hall. Now, that is not true. And the other charge was that on about March 24, 2009, Kenneth Armstrong commenced a civil action in the Supreme Court of the State of New York against the former bishop and, and, and the vestry and so on. And that is true. And that case is still before the court. He says here, the allegations of the petition sworn to by Canon Armstrong, among other things, alleged matters related to the doctrine discipline and worship and polity of the church. That is not true. The, the case before the civil court has to do with a contract. It continues that on November 3rd, 2008, the former bishop issued a pastoral direction to me, which I ignored. And that is not true either. Next charge that he made against me was about my residence in the rectory. And my brothers and sisters I want to say this that. Even to this day, and this is my first recording, March 15, 2013, exactly three years after my inhibition. To that day, I have not been able to get my personal belongings out of the rectory. I've been given the runaround. The bishop sent and had the locks and the rectory changed and my property is still there. Most of my property is still there. Badly damaged by a flood which uh, happened there in the rectory. The next charge that he made against me, this is the most serious one. During much, if not all, of his rectorship of the parish, Canon Armstrong maintained a discretionary fund. In 2009, this firm, the Compton firm, was engaged to do a review and analysis of the said discretionary fund. And that's what the Compton firm did, a review and analysis. Not an audit, because an audit to state that it was an audit would give one the impression that I was given a chance to explain, to present documentation. So I was never contacted by anybody or asked by anybody 
first time I knew about this was when I received a copy of these charges. And it's very unfair. And at another time, I will uh, give some more details about the so-called findings. And that accountant is going to have to deal with this because I don't know what kind of accountant he is, what kind of professional he is, in stating that I did not administer the fund properly and so on. And when he did not ask me, did not contact me, and I did not have access to the records at the time. And just for the, uh, the records, for people who don't know how this works, the director's discretionary fund on a monthly basis had less than $100. And the parish where I served, the demands on a monthly basis would be more in the thousands including demands for assistance from members of the congregation. Most of the money that went into the discretionary fund came from my personal funds, came from my pocket. Including on one occasion, and I did invest my money in real estate, I didn't waste my money, my money was spent on my family, helping people, lending money to people, and investing a few dollars and uh, on one occasion I uh, sold a property that I had uh, and sat down the profit I wrote a check for twenty thousand dollars to the discretionary fund and put it in the fund to help people help to sponsor people to the church including the two members of the vestry the two wardens that are the principles and the problems that I'm facing today. The two wardens that signed the promissory notes, the two wardens that went to the ecclesiastical court and told lies about me. Anyhow, the discretionary fund was administered by me to feed the poor to help to sponsor people, people who were here illegally. And of course, if one questions whether this was the right purpose, well, at the time, I, I thought that I was doing the right thing because the people who are here illegally cannot work legally. And very often, you know, they, they, they suffered. And I felt that this was very charitable, being able to help them to regularize and legalize their status through the opportunity provided by the church. And I did it legally using my own funds. I've never asked of anybody a penny for help of them. And the, the thing is that the vestry through the years knew that I was helping people uh, to become productive citizens of this country and, and, and productive members of the church. The discretionary fund was also used in order to raise funds for the, the, the fund itself. We had a cruise. We had a cruise. There were two cruises that we attempted to have, and, the, and these cruises were handled by the discretionary fund. The discretionary fund. Why? And this was all done with the permission and the decision of the vestry. The reason being that if cruises were handled directly by the, 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 the church itself, the income, the money that people pay to the church to be paid to the travel agency for the cruise and so on, would appear as the total, as part of the total of the income for the church at the end of the year. And the assessment was based on the total income, not net income, but the, uh, the gross income. So it was decided by the vestry that to handle the cruise through the church itself, it would give a false picture of the true income. 
So they said, well, since you, you, you're trying to raise some funds uh, for the discretionary fund to, to help people, hand it to the discretionary fund. So when the, 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 the accountant talks about ACs, uh, money is being paid in and going out immediately, that has to do with people who were paying uh, for the cruise. And I have documentation right here. And all that I will produce. In fact, I have it recorded in my, in, in my more detailed uh, documentary account. There were also occasions when people gave directly to the discretionary fund. And this was approved by the ministry. Remember that between 1987 and 2008, there were quite a few vestries. There were members of the vestry who overlapped because members were able to serve up to six years and so on. I, I reckon that there were about 75 different people who served in the vestry during that period of time. And the vestry, there was nothing that was done that the vestry did not know about and approve. That's how I operated. You see, but the impression would be given that all this I did and did on my own. And that is not so. The minutes of the various Veshi meetings, and we had Veshi meetings regularly every month, with the exception of July and August. But even then, there was a financial report that was presented at every Veshi meeting. So, I just want to say this, that it is very unfair that, that I should be accused of mismanaging the discretionary fund when no explanations were asked of me. And it certainly was not an audit. This was a review and analysis. And I want to say this here, that I am going to see to it that every other parish in this diocese and this is due process. If you're going to accuse me of administering the, the discretionary fund in the wrong way, then let, let us see how others have done, how this, what was the general practice, because I did it according to the general practice at that time. But I want to tell you truthfully, I've never spent a penny of discretionary fund on myself or my family. It was about helping others, including sending money to the diocese, to the bishops, uh, discretionary fund, the bishop's call. And I am hoping that they would have an audit of that bishop's call as well to see how it was administered by the former bishop. This is so very unfair. Very, very unfair. These were the charges that were directed against me by the Bishop of the Diocese. There was a hearing uh, in 2012, I think it was, uh, January of 2012. The Ecclesiastical Court convened uh, the court because the uh, review committee, which is the sort of equivalent of a grand jury, recommended that I uh, should be tried. And I just want to say this here. See, I refer to that court as a kangaroo court because the review committee consisted of people who were gay and who were not my friends because they knew that I held different views, including one from my own country who uh, told me when he came here, I, I attempted to sponsor him and somebody else, one of the uh, one of the superiors in the diocese sponsored him and he told me, he said that his superior told him not to, if he wants to move ahead in the diocese, not to associate with me because, uh, you know, I am not uh, on the best terms with the bishop. Well, I'm glad I didn't associate with him because I don't belong to that club and I never will. But imagine a review committee consisting of people who are known to be gay or pro-gay. What chance did I have? None whatsoever. 
And that particular priest that came from my country, what he needs to do is to tell people why he came here, why he had to run away from the country. And more would be told about that. He told his congregation that he was a bishop's friend. The bishop was his friend. I mean, what chance did I have? So I didn't take this, this ecclesiastical uh, court trial very seriously at all because it was, in my view, uh, a kangaroo court. And as I wrote to them, to my attorney, I, and I told them that I did not want to be involved in this because it would involve matters, We're dealing with matters that were before the civil court, and, and that would have been highly improper. But they, that did not prevent them from doing what they wanted to do. So they continued. I did attend the first day of hearing, uh, and I made it quite clear to the court then that I was not going to continue because of the fact that uh, I, I did not have a consultant, I was not given a consultant at the beginning of the whole process, and therefore the convening of that ecclesiastical court was uncanonical and highly improper, and I still believe that I was right. I did not stay. But they continued the hearing in my absence, and I have here before me the transcript of the evidence given by the two wardens of the parish where I served, the two wardens who had signed the promissory notes, the two wardens uh, who had created the, the problems there, and, and, and I tell you, uh, the, the ways in which they create problems, the details are uh, too long, the time being, but uh, you will hear about them in, in the process of time. Those wardens went to the hearing and lied, and I have those lies on record. Among the lies, one of them said that I forced, I used to force a member of the vestry who was a signatory to the church's account, I used to force him to sign checks. And that was not true. I have his statements on record here. And I, when I read the statement, I called the member of the vestry who used to sign the checks. And I asked him whether I ever forced him to sign checks. He said, of course not. He said that was a decision that was made by the vestry, that he would be a signatory to the, 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 the account because he used to work nearby. So that was a very damaging lie that that uh, warden told. Second warden, uh, this is a warden that I, both of them I sponsored in this country, using my own funds, and using funds for the discretionary, to the dis discretionary fund in order to help them and their families to become citizens. And they went and they lied. They both lied and lied about finances and other things. And I have the record here. And I have proof that they're lying. And then a member of the congregation, this is one of the charges uh, made against me that I uh, made an improper phone call to a member of the congregation. And I'll tell you briefly what that was about, I was informed reliably that uh, one of the wardens before mentioned uh, uh, was in a, a sort of improper um, relationship with one of the youngsters committed to his charge. Uh, I have sponsored him through the church as youth director, and one of these young ladies, she was minor, used to uh, go to his home uh, and spend time at his home and uh, uh, the wife told somebody that that she uh, found, he told them in a rather compromising and uncomfortable in her mind position. I called, when I heard this, I called the mother. She's the only person that I called and mentioned what I had heard. And the mother listened to me, and the mother, after she finished speaking with me, she contacted an attorney, 
And the attorney wrote me, accusing me of making this uh, uh, discomforting uh, phone call to a member of the congregation. Now that was very unfortunate. Because all I did was to tell her what I heard, and to tell her that I was going to inform the bishop, since I was no longer the rector of the parish, I could, I could not deal with the matter. I would inform the bishop and let him take the matter uh, further, including contacting the police to investigate this. And I, this matter is still open. But this mother went to the ecclesiastical court and gave evidence against me and lied and said that, that I said that if this uh, warden did not leave the church, that I would tell people, in other words, I would make up the story that, that he had interfered with her daughter. And I never said that. It's a good thing that I recorded her conversation. And let me tell you this, my brothers and sisters, before I did this, I had the best legal advice. It's a good thing that I recorded conversations with the church attorney of this diocese. I recorded conversations with the bishop and I found them lying. In one conversation, the bishop said that he had never met the church attorney. He did not know him. Uh, he had heard of him. He, kn he knew who he was. But the church attorney, in, a, in another conversation with me, told me, of course, he said, he said I don't know the bishop. He showed me a letter. The bishop appointed me to be the church attorney and so on. I found him lying. In fact, I have evidence, and I want the bishop to know, I have evidence of collusion among all these folks that were involved in this case, beginning at the top with his superiors. And that's a separate matter that I'm going to deal with because this matter is not just about Llewellyn Armstrong and this diocese, it's about the Episcopal Church and Llewellyn Armstrong and a lot of the injustice that is going on in the Episcopal Church. Uh, it's like the persecution of people who don't go along with this same-sex uh, marriage agenda. I want the bishop to know that he has treated me very unfairly. I want the bishop to know that he lied, okay? I would say you made mistakes, but if you made mistakes and you discover that there were mistakes, apologize and correct them. But only bullies are the type of people who ignore rules and regulations, ignore laws and canons, and that's what you did. Now you came to this whole situation with unclean hands, Bishop. The canons were there. You did not um, uh, consult the vestry of Calvin and Cyprians uh, before you appointed this, this, this bishop to, to be priest in charge. You, 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 you sent this priest in charge to preside at a meeting against the, the law. You did not give me a consultant when you should have given me a consultant. I got a consultant just eight days before the, 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 the actual trial. You, you, uh, the, 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 the convention, I, I received a, 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 a notice of convention, I went to convention. Not even you knew the rules and regulations about that because if you had known that, you would have known that it was not for you to decide all by yourself, but that convention should have had the right to decide. And I will show how the Secretary of Convention was part of this conspiracy. And I will tell more about the rude letter that he wrote to me, telling me that I was not allowed back on convention the following year, not even as an observer. I will tell you more about the lies that were told. And Bishop? It's a good thing that I recorded my conversation with you, two and a half hours in your office. I recorded it. And so I am willing at the right time to share that recording with anybody who's interested to show how you have treated me. You have been so unfair to me. When I went to sit with you, 
to make see if you could make peace and to bring the case uh, that was pending before the ecclesiastical court to uh, an end. I went to sit with you on the advice of a, a, a priest, a good friend of mine, who seeks peace. When I went and listened to the terms that the bishop was demanding of me, he told me that I would have to be satisfied to be suspended for 10 years. And I told him that in 10 years, both he and I could be dead. And I felt it was so unfair, and I was not prepared to accept that as an offer. And he suggested that we should go ahead uh, to the ecclesiastical court hearing, because he knew beforehand, he knew beforehand that he had it all wrapped up. From the very beginning, when he inhibited me, back in March of 2010, when he inhibited me, I called him and, and told him how I felt about that, how unfair I felt it was, because he had not spoken with me. And he told me then that, you know, since I called him to lecture to him, that he would go ahead and do what he had to do uh, uh, from the very beginning, and that was to have me deposed. And I will show you, I will show my listeners the ways in which that conspiracy, conspiracy played itself out. And that bishop, bishop, I tell you, you are a bully. You're not a pastor. You need to seek professional help because I have you on, on, on a record admitting that a statement that you made to convention after convention reconvened in November of uh, 2010, the 13th of, of November, when you reconvened, you made a statement about me, uh, an ethnic, ethnically improper statement, a racially charged statement. And I have you on record admitting that that was not the kind of statement that a bishop should be making. You admitted that. That is, you said it was conduct on becoming a bishop. You admitted that, and I have that on record, and I'm prepared to play it for the whole world to hear. Now, what is going to be done with you for the many ways in which you have broken the canons? You've come to this whole thing with unclean hands, and you have charged me, and you've, you've allowed uh, you, 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 the people that you had that feel that they have to, they have to please you. You know, they, they, they did declared me guilty, but I know I'm not guilty of any of the charges that you have made against me. You are the one that should be charged. And we're going to see this, how this is going to be played out. Because I have the record, I have the recordings of, of the, the staff at the highest level in the church. I have the recordings. I have the written uh, communication. I have the recordings, uh, my conversations with you. I have the recordings of my conversations with the church attorney. And I'm prepared to let the whole world know, see how you have treated me very unfairly. You are a bully. And I'm standing up to you as a bully, as I promise. So my brothers and sisters, I know uh, that this is going to be very disturbing for you. But you can imagine how disturbing it is for me. There's so much that, that in this that really uh, disappointed me. Um, and talking about ordination vows, the bishop has forgotten that he made vows too. But you see, bullies don't have to observe any rules and regulations. Bullies, you know, they go by their own rules. And really, ultimately, we know that bullies are cowards. And Bishop, you are a coward. You can't stand up to me. For example, when, you, when we had the, 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 the court trial, you, were, you said you were coming. I invited you. I couldn't summon you, but I invited you to be a witness. You said you would come. You never came. At the last minute, you changed your mind. But the worst thing that you did was, in, the, in January of this year, when you, quote-unquote, deposed me, you know, when you accomplish your mission, your evil mission, when you deposed me. And that was after I had transferred to another branch of the Anglican Communion. Uh, you deposed me. You denied me the right to be present at the deposition, to speak to you. Even after you had written to me and quoted the canons, giving me the right to be present and to make any uh, statements to you, uh, give you any reason why I thought you were making a mis big mistake. 
at the last minute through my consultant. He denied me the right. He said I could come, but I could not speak. Now, here you are again, breaking, ignoring the canons, because you felt that you could do whatever you feel like doing to me, and nobody can do anything about it. But I'm telling you, that if I have to do it alone, I will do it. I'm standing up to you because you are a bully. You're an evil man. And so, my brothers and sisters, uh, that's the end of this session. God willing, uh, I will be uh, presenting other sessions which you will find even more interesting. But I just want you to know that I want to have peace. I offered on several occasions even to bring the case out of the civil court as long as the representatives of the church are willing to sit down with me and to talk with me and to make arrangements to pay me my money. But instead, as I said, money is being wasted. And I blame the, 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 the vestry of this parish for just standing by and watching uh, the bishop do all this to me when they know the truth about what is happening and what happened in the past. And, and those, of the, those of the members of the vestry who know me, and I've had uh, some affidavits, I have a few affidavits as well from uh, vest, present vestry members and former vestry members. So I'm prepared to share all the, that information with the whole world at this point because I offered to sit with the bishop and, 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 and in peace, in the spirit of, of peace, to bring closure to this whole case. But he has denied me that right. Every time I stretch out my hand to offer peace, that hand was slapped. That hand was just uh, refused. So I am ready to fight.